Okay. Um, well, during last two weeks, I have decided to change a bit my direction of research, to switch to the problem of um, mechanosensory mechanisms uh, underlying uh, Seligan's functioning and behavior. Um, so, uh, I previously uh, already uh, planned uh, to spend some attention to this question. Um, but um, now it's really time to, to do something around uh, neurons, uh, sensory systems, and so on, because we need to move uh, into this uh, direction in parallel with uh, warm body uh, development. So, I have found and read uh, a few dozens of uh, papers uh, and chapters in the books, uh, which are most uh, corresponding uh, to the mechanosensory uh, system of uh, C. elegans. Uh, I will try to share my screen to show the most important things. Uh, the information that um, we have six touch receptor neurons. Um, and well, mm, when I started uh, to mm, read about this, all of them uh, listed here were um, equally uh, interesting for us. Uh, we could uh, take any of them and try, for example, to reproduce uh, in the simulation somehow. Uh, but later I have found uh, one uh, paper which may play a key role for our further uh, movement in this direction. I have found that uh, it was found uh, experimentally, uh, most probably for the first time, uh, the fact uh, that the signal uh, which starts from um, which starts from the top uh, um, from from the head tip uh, of the um, uh, serigans. Um, it's not axon; it's long uh, dendrite, uh, which uh, passes the signal uh, from the place where gentle touch was applied to the worm. Uh, to the uh, body of a m a neuron, um, and it was uh, measured um, that uh, 350 uh, micrometers uh, was passed um, during uh, 45 uh, micro milliseconds, uh, so we can easily. Uh, Find, calculate uh, velocity of signal propagation. This is one important question. Um, now we know it, uh, at least some um, value which is, uh, well, which works for C elegance. So we can expect that uh, other values might be like this, plus, minus some uh, value around. Um, uh, also, there were a lot of papers uh, about um, about um, electrophysiology of um, such neurons, about um, electrotonical uh, propagation of the potential. Uh, everywhere, uh, authors uh, write that. There is no any uh, uh, spikes uh, which uh, work uh, for um, propagation of signal, except for uh, motor neurons uh, on the way from the neuron to a muscle. So everywhere else is uh, grad gradual potentials, uh, electrotonical potentials. So now. Uh, we can say that 
one of the most actual tasks um, might be to reproduce this simple process. Uh, somebody touches the worm near the head uh, tip, gentle touch, then the signal um, is generated somehow. Um, we only just um, activate the beginning of the uh, dendrite and then just simulate um, the propagation of the signal uh, until it reaches uh, that neuron. And the model should be good enough to reproduce this experimentally known uh, velocity of signal propagation and also take into account its um, attenuation during this way and so on. Of course, uh, after this neuron, there is a circuit of other neurons uh, which work with the signal, process it, and finally activate some muscle um, response. But uh, better, more systematical, uh, and translated. Cool. Uh, and Andre, is the plan um, is the plan to um, work with the neuronal model that we have uh, uh, in the in the C elegance neuronal repository, for instance, for. Um, ALM, uh, like we do have that which corresponds to the scaffolding for the multi-compartment uh, model for the neuron, or we also have a counterpart in C302, which, uh, which is obviously a much simpler model where you cannot uh, like put in calcium concentration or anything like that. But we, we, So is the plan to basically uh, try and uh, reproducing these uh, um, this behavior in terms of the um, uh, transmission of the signal and the latency that is coming from this paper uh, by uh, characterizing, let's say, the uh, model of the of the neuron that we have there in neuromel. Is that going to be the approach, or you want to take something I don't know more free, like I don't know, starting from scratch with the C model or something like that? Um, I have tried to um, read about uh, neuron software uh, about its properties. Um, and the ways of uh, simulation of neurons. No, I have not finished with this, but I see that this approach might have good perspectives. Um, is it correct that uh, neuroML uh, can be easily coupled with a uh, neuron simulator? Uh, then it would be a good step to try this. Uh, well, we might not need um, currently such detailed uh, model of geometry uh, of this mm -hmm. neuron because it can be simply uh, approximated uh, with um, very thin uh, dendrite, uh, very long and thin uh, cylinder and uh, spherical uh, cell at the end. Uh, there will be enough if we keep uh, geometry, and well, ionic channels might be very important, but since we uh, work with electrotonical uh, potentials, they have not very high uh, amplitude, and they should not uh, significantly affect um, ion channels activity. Mm, that one which is responsible for uh, signal propagation. Maybe uh, some processes which regenerate uh, ionic concentrations uh, will work, uh, but m might be uh, this will not mm, influence significantly on the processes in which we are interested uh, currently. Uh, I need to check all this, make some estimates, some digits, some of them already found, some are still waiting for this. So, I'm not sure yet about this, but okay. uh, I, I, I thought about this way and it seems quite perspective.
Hi, a question for Andre. Uh, hey, Andre, it's Giovanni. Um, so you're moving on to this stuff. Is um, are you happy with the state of SPH, uh, or is this temporary? Or are you gonna do both? J just to understand if you consider SPH to be stable enough that it's basically done, and then. Basically, I just thought in terms of what are your plans for the future for for SPH for the near future. Uh, I don't plan to stop uh, work on uh, SPH and warm body, but I would like to split my activities into two threads, uh, like okay. SPH and uh, some near scientific uh, aspects, because we need to move. Further in this direction, uh, also. Um, since uh, Sergey is not here today, uh, I would also like to say a good news from him. Um, he brilliantly found uh, the an error uh, which caused a very low work of uh, speech. I spent quite a lot of time during uh, previous two weeks and um, haven't found it. Uh, but Sergei was much more <laughs> successful than me. Uh, there was some um, flag uh, or some um, or in properties of the project there was some um, directive uh, the properties of uh, OpenCL. Uh, so the project worked in release, and OpenCL was forced to work in debug mode. So oh. that was the reason which caused uh, to work all the simulation very slowly. Ah, nice. And when he removed it, um, then uh, everything uh, started to work, uh, as I expected, uh, about seven times faster. <laughs> No, no, uh, that was just uh, debug mode of uh, OpenSea. Uh, some, some long time ago, uh, <laughs> this bug was uh, somehow it was introduced into the program, and after that, it kept for a long time uh, until he was. So I had a um, feeling that about a year ago everything worked uh, faster and then something changed. But I thought it was because we made a very complex scene which contained a lot of particles, the worm and so on, muscles. But <laughs> it was a, a correct feeling. Uh, there was a slowing down due to this error. That's great. So Sergey conti continues work on this, on this page, on some aspects of uh, integration uh, of equations of um, moment, uh, and so on. So everything goes goes quite well. Yes, uh, thank you. So I, I'm a professor in Montreal, in Canada, and I found your Open Worm project uh, a few weeks ago, and I thought it was pretty interesting. I'm looking for interesting things to visualize, because my research area is visualization. And um, I might be able to contribute by writing some code, or maybe finding a student who could contribute to do maybe a master's project around it. And uh, after discussing with uh, Matteo, I think it was uh, yesterday, uh, I put together some design ideas, and I have a, a little URL I can share with you. So maybe, let's cool. see. I'm, I'm using Hangouts, so I think I can paste the URL. So maybe we can discuss that later. Oh, okay. Great. So, so in, in discussing... Uh, uh, yesterday with uh, with Matteo, one thing that seemed interesting to me was visualizing the activity in the nervous system. And I I have uh, almost no background in biology, uh, but 
but I do have some research experience with visualizing networks, and um, and the, the 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 nervous system of the worm is interesting because it's not just a static network, but there's information flowing through it, there's signals, right? So uh, Matteo showed me the uh, the sort of 3D visualization of the morphology of the nervous system, and it might be useful to have other visualizations. So if you if you look at the URL I I pasted, it's a bunch of slides. Uh, so slide number two, uh, I hope everyone can see that. Slide number two shows some previous work by some of the researchers where they're visualizing a whole bunch of time series data, and they found a way to show lots of data in a small amount of space. The idea is that you take each row of pixels, and you show you, you use the color of the pixels to show uh, the changing value of some scalar quantity over time. And if the user is interested, they can click on a single row and then it grows and it becomes a little line graph. So it, in slide number two, you can see a, a few of the pixels have been converted to line graphs, so they take up more space vertically, but you can more easily see how the quantity is changing. Now imagine that each of these rows was uh, a neuron, or activity in a neuron or something. Maybe this would be a, a useful idea. So slide number three shows a little sketch where you've got three neurons, and then uh, you have sort of a, um, a horizontal band of information for each neuron. So there's orange showing the input to the neuron that slowly grows and then eventually it causes a spike to be sent down the axon that's shown in blue. Uh, slide number four shows that you could have a whole bunch of these. So maybe, uh, maybe vertically you have 304 of these or whatever the number is. Horizontally you have time. You could also have little circular arcs which are shown on the left. That's on slide four. So maybe these arcs show connections between the neurons. And then slide number five shows that you could color code the rows or the arcs according to various things. Uh, maybe they're colored by type of neuron or type of connection. Uh, slide number six shows that uh, the, the user has put their cursor over one neuron and maybe some things highlight to show the, uh, the upstream neurons, like a, the, sort of the parents, or maybe you highlight the children or maybe that's in a different color. Uh, and then the last slide just shows some ideas for how you could color things. So you could color, of course, according to topology, but um, I was chatting in the chat yesterday. It, it occurred to me that you could color also by maybe clustering the neurons. I, I suppose there's other people who have thought about this, but you could uh, maybe figure out that two neurons uh, cause similar reactions in the, in the nervous system, and therefore they're somehow similar to each other, and then that could be used to color them somehow or cluster them or something. So this is just a sketch. Um, I'm 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 happy to hear comments. I'm all, I'd also be very interested in in finding a customer for this type of interface because if if I or one of my students build an interface to visualize the activity of the neurons, it'd be great if we had a customer, like one of you or maybe a biologist or someone who has scientific questions, and then we could use that to justify the way we've designed the interface, and then we can publish a paper on it or something. I also put in another paper. This is the recent Manuel Alzheimer paper. Uh, so these guys also record simultaneously from all neurons of uh, C. elegans. So you might want to have a look at this as well. Nice. Yeah. The one one thing uh, one potential development of this is, uh, of course, the making it into a widget. So uh, one of the options uh, you said uh, earlier, Stephen, we were actually discussing it yesterday in terms of uh, a, a way, obviously. Uh, for, first of all, there's the whole study about the requirements, how to do the interface and all of that. But then it could uh, um, easily be a smarter version of the time series uh, widget that we do have. Uh, well, this is just a plotting widget that we have at the moment that would be more something like a time series widget that could uh, basically receive data from the server and like having, a, as uh, Michael was uh, showing, like uh, one line pixel for each one of the neurons and things like that that you can expand, that would be rather cool. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, so my my uh, web programming skills are woefully obsolete, um, but I, I have some students who sometimes are pretty good at it, and uh, I I myself could program something standalone like um, like Python or C plus plus or Java or whatever. So uh, actually, um, a good 
a good first step for me might be to get my hands on some data, like the data you were showing in the Matt uh, Matt Plot Plot Lib. I think you said it was, or 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 maybe a description of the network, or or both. So, uh, sorry, is there a link uh, to the code I should download, or is someone I should talk to? This is this is GitHub. So, is there is there a link to download a zip of everything, or do I need a? Okay, and if I have questions, should I email you or Mateo or someone else? Okay. I'll, I'll take a look at the zip file right now, and I, I guess uh, if, if feel free to move on to the next person. If I have questions, I'll I'll ask them. Thank you. Now you can hear me, right? Okay. Sorry, we just muted earlier. Yes. Yeah, so uh, as I said in the email uh, that I sent out just uh, an hour ago, I made a little write up about the motif analysis pipeline that I'm building up. So far, in the last few months, I find a lot of ways that's not working. But uh, sort of right now, I took, put together a pipeline that's working quite well for Drosophila. So I tested the so for the checkup, the eigenvorm approach, and the CL elegance videos that I have, and I get the same results as the original paper. So that was a nice confirmation. But as finding these behavioral motifs, I have not checked them yet uh, on CL elegance. Uh, that's 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 going to be the next step. But right now, I'm trying to write it up and wrap it up as an article, and that's going to focus on Drosophila. So first, I just want to make sure that so everything is working well for Drosophila, and then I'm going to look at uh, more closely uh, for the CL against data. Uh, I wasn't able to uh, actually I lied in the email because I haven't uploaded the document yet to Google Drive, but then Google Drive crashed uh, or did not work. Uh, but I'm going to do this. Uh, we do upload it uh, after I finish with that. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's uh, that's about it for me. Uh, I'll keep adding to this document as I keep developing the pipeline. But uh, if you guys, especially uh, if people who are involved in the movement validation, will be able to have a quick look at it, a read through, and just uh, give some feedback whether it makes sense or not, uh, that would be good. And sorry, just one thing that I wanted to say. So what I think is a realistic timeline for me is that I hope to finish this paper uh, towards the second half of the summer. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, I can work in parallel with the work with the paper. But uh, yeah, right now, I just want to make sure that everything works well for Drosophila and then make those fine tuning adjustments for uh, C. elegans. Uh, no, nothing. Nothing came through yet. Uh, well, I think you you get all the emails that I get. So if anything is happening, you're gonna see it as soon as I see it. Uh, yeah, actually today I got an email from Frontier, so I was very keen to open it, but it was just uh, one of these self advertisement things. So that was disappointing. But <laughs> I think you're gonna hear hear from them quite soon. Can you uh, throw the agenda link to the chat? Like, usually I do it first, but um, the Netherlands. So last two weeks, I spent, uh, as you know, the Kickstarter campaign finished. So there's a lot of stuff to do uh, in terms of the Kickstarter itself, like getting those things moving. And the, the first milestone there is like get the physical reward to people. So that process has started in the form of uh, putting together surveys for the backers collect their information. And um, so right now, I am heavily involved in basically putting those surveys together and make make sure that um, they are sent to the, um, to the backers so that we can get uh, information back. We can use that information to fulfill the physical rewards. Uh, so that, that's one of the things that I'm doing and it's been going on over the last two weeks, plus all the planning aspects of fulfilling the Kickstarter stuff. And at the same time, I started uh, working on development again. Uh, and in particular, I, since I, I wasn't doing any development for a while because I was busy with the Kickstarter stuff, I basically reinstalled my development environment. By And uh, while I was doing that, I tested the new um, scripts that uh, Matt was working on, and uh, some other people as well that made improvements to those. And um, the outcome of that process was 
few few uh, issues open on GitHub uh, with the uh, basically pointing out problems that I found along the way. But we had discussed that in more details at the development meeting that we have on Mondays. Uh, so I'm not gonna go and repeat all of that. All the issues are on GitHub. But yeah, so I have my development environment up and running. I have a card assigned to me. I started working also on uh, some design tasks with Matteo today that have to do with um, uh, basically improvements in Geppetto. Uh, a kind of fairly detailed uh, refactoring that I don't know that this is the best place to go in that on. But yeah, basically getting the engine started again on development and uh, moving along the, the Kickstarter um, uh, administrational aspects of uh, making sure that people are happy with uh, what we send them. Uh, so that's pretty much my update. And uh, yeah, in terms of the Kickstarter, we, we go in more depth about that stuff at the Kickstarter committee meetings. And um, it's going to be one of those meetings probably next week. I'm going to send invites out to the people who are on the committee. And uh, that's pretty much my update. Hey, everybody. Um, let me just pull up our meeting agenda here. Uh, <clears throat> actually, most of the work that I've been doing, as usual, is uh, with Michael. Um, so mainly what I have to say is what Michael has to say. Uh, mainly, uh, we are still working on future translation. We're hoping to have that done uh, by this meeting, but it will definitely be done by the next one, I promise. You can, you can hold me to that. Yeah, um, me too. And uh, <clears throat> we had some discussions with uh, Dr. Uh, Rich uh, Gherkin about uh, frame, testing framework. I guess we talked about that last time. Um, have we, well, yeah, have we set up a meeting for that yet? Um, okay. Um, so so uh, we will have that feature translation finished soon. The next thing we're going to be moving to is uh, getting... Uh, outputs from simulations, or at least the next thing I'll be moving into, I'm not sure about Michael, is uh, getting outputs from uh, simulations into this feature processing framework uh, so that we can compute those features on models. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. I don't know if Mike, since Michael and I are basically working on this together, Michael, I don't know if you have anything else to add or if people have questions about it. Yeah, I can, um, I can just add that I'm so yeah, also working on the, the MATLAB to Python translation. I'm not going to speak to anything in terms of next steps until that's done. So I'll reserve my uh, my thoughts on that. But um, but yeah, what you're doing there with the outputs that sounds interesting for a uh, next step, uh, Jim. And that could be my update too, because that's basically exactly what I was going to say. And then uh, one uh, one final thing is uh, at some point I'm not sure what the status is of. Uh, the scripts for uh, adding data uh, or converting data uh, so that Geppetto can read it. Um, I, I apologize, I missed that last time. I don't know if we talked about it, but uh, particularly we had asked for one thing was just metadata so that uh, if anything changes, uh, you would know that the file format you were looking at previously was not the same as the file format you were looking at currently, and that I think was supported there was also a request <clears throat> to put in um, multi-dimensional data. Um, I think in particular, um, we were looking at the skeleton points over time. Uh, so the idea being that instead of like a voltage trace over time where it's a single value over time, now you're looking at uh, points along the worm over time. And because of that, that's now a, a sort of multi-dimensional thing. So I don't know if there's, uh, what the progress is on that, but uh, once those scripts are in place, again, it should be relatively easy for us to to start saving data for people to play with in Geppetto. Um, I think Johan is will uh, <laughs> talk um, about that. Okay. Yeah, so um, as you said, the, the metadata is already included, and um, the multi-dimensional data and matrices um, I've worked on and I think it should actually work, but um, so it is kind of put back now because I am uh, currently analyzing uh, another data format, um, 
that Matteo has uh, found two weeks ago. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that in my update. But um, so I mean, I don't know how, how um, uh, when you need the uh, matrices or um, or multi-dimensional um, data to be added. So if, if you say you need it next week, you can just sit down uh, half a day and finish it. But um, I mean, in case you don't need it, I'll just um, leave it open until we have uh, decided on uh, on which form what we are and what you're going to use. Yeah, I think I think at this point in time, let's uh, let's wait. If you guys are trying to figure out what uh, what what you need or what you'd like to work with, uh, there's no rush on our end. We certainly have enough to do. So. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, so I can just uh, say a little bit. So uh, the status last time was that, um, yeah, as I said, Matteo found this uh, neuroscience simulation data format, they call it, um, that's done by a group from Poland. And um, yeah, I've spent some time now analyzing what they have done and um, how we can use this. And um, Matteo and me, we had a talk uh, some days ago, and we basically concluded that the format uh, is quite good, and it would save us a lot of work, especially in terms of um, adding support for other neural simulators. Um, but of course, it uh, kind of uh, it is pretty uh, neuroscience specific, and so um, especially as Geppetto wants to be a more general simulation platform, um, we thought uh, more about um, or, or, or well, I thought about a way how we can um, keep the generic, keep a generic data format for Geppetto, and, and on the same hand, um, integrate what they have done or um, yeah, or what they will be doing. So um, yeah, I'm still working a bit on this, and on Friday we'll have a meeting um, with the group from Poland, and yeah, just pass this. Uh, all these things, um, what we are and what going to use, or how we, are, how we are going to include their work, and um, other things. Um, so uh, yeah, this this uh, loading bug I had with Geppetto, uh, we were finally uh, able to resolve uh, that one. Um, and uh, I don't know how how um, how far the solution for this is. Maybe Matteo can say something on that. And the um, last point is that uh, I uh, followed Mark's example now and um, created a short blog. I'll post the link. Um, so yeah, I'll just uh, post about uh, one post uh, per week or so and um, give a short summary of what I've been doing. And um, yeah, everyone is welcome to have a look at that. Yeah, basically, Jim, what happened in the in the in the past weeks is that um, these format like uh, I, I I met when I was at the open source brain meeting. Uh, I met uh, some people that uh, were working to a recording format uh, in parallel, and that they actually had started much earlier. Okay, so in uh, basically. Uh, I don't like uh, redoing stuff uh, or diverging uh, if possible. So since uh, the, uh, since they are um, basically uh, open to the idea of uh, potentially modifying that format if needed, uh, and uh, they already have some models that are stored in that format, uh, uh, I, I just want to make sure we do what makes most sense. And instead of duplicating effort, uh, if need being, uh, uh, Pause uh, development uh, on the on the recording format and on the script for a couple of weeks, but then having something that long term is much more stable and much like many people can use it and can contribute to it. So that is uh, uh, that evaluation progress is uh, um, process is actually uh, ongoing at the moment, and like I would hope that uh, by uh, the end of next week we would have uh, something that we can uh, resume working on in terms of uh, um, support for everything that you need uh, and support needed for other stuff. So that, that is what happened in a, in a short path. 
Guys, uh, sorry, just going to say hi because I have to take off. There's a student staff meeting in two minutes. That's going to be a lot of fun and I have to attend. Uh, so, yeah, see you guys around. Thanks. Bye. Um, forgot I muted myself. Okay, so uh, we've been having some conversations about the lineage data and how we want to model it. And uh, we kind of got the, I like, understand what the, uh, basic idea of a differentiation uh, tree is supposed to look like. So I'm going to start you know, writing some, uh, I guess, some more API calls that kind of communicate that. I've also been uh, working on updating the PyOpenWorm API. And you can look at it right there. Um, so uh, I would like to get you know, like comments on that if people think that there are some things that are like obviously missing, uh, and you know, that they would actually want to use for, you know, uh, adding things to the database. Uh, and if you want a description uh, on that page, and uh, also on the issue that uh, Stephen just posted, I think. Yeah. So th there's a lot of detail uh, on that. Um, and then I've also been looking at uh, how we can encode constraints uh, on the database, uh, mostly for when we're inputting data, and also doing some inference to uh, you know, get new facts about the data and hopefully make it easier to work with. Uh, and then just for my better understanding of uh, the OpenWorm project, I've been looking at how we do some of the simulations, uh, where the data is ending up from uh, eventually the database and how it's being used now. So just uh, kind of following off what I've, I've been doing uh, since I joined the project. Uh, so that's uh, what I've actually been doing, and uh, I think by the next time we meet, I should have the, uh, that draft API that I posted finished uh, to the degree that I, uh, yeah, to the degree that you know we have a basic idea of what we're writing, uh, and I've also started writing some of the uh, implementation in parallel with that. Uh, and also, if I don't, I don't know if I updated anyone on this before, but uh, these I have a fork of C elegans NoRML, which is reading from the database, uh, just by like my sort of informal evaluation. It looks like it's uh, working the same way as it was when it was reading from the NoRML files, and I'm going to be putting in. Uh, uh, some modifications, so it's reading from the uh, cell morphology, which is also in the database. So it should, it's not going to be something changing, uh, like how any of the simulation is generated. So it's uh, you know, just making sure all the links are in place. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be doing uh, uh, soonish. And uh, yeah, filling out the API. Uh, so, uh, any questions or comments? Yeah, uh, at this point, we're only uh, making NeuroML files, but uh, I'm relying like on NeuroConstruct to output to other simulation formats uh, for right now. And then if we, you know, want to. I'll put other formats. We can look into that too. Okay. Uh, sorry, I won't type because uh, my I, I, <laughs> my arm hurts and I cannot type. <laughs> so I will uh, um, I will try to remember. Uh, like many things happened. So there is the um, there was a let's start from the there was a Geppetto meeting uh, on Monday and. Uh, uh, we we moved on progress on uh, many different fronts. So uh, 
as always, as like there's you know people like uh, Michael. This is that might not have this link. So this is the board where um, this is the board where um, all the existing uh, um, issues uh, on GitHub regarding um, regarding Geppetto are collected, and uh, so you will see that there are um, that there are issues that I have as milestone on spring 27 which just means uh, this week that just started and the next week so um, that's um, basically the things that have um, that milestone are things that uh, we aim uh, to complete uh, uh, in the next two weeks so I um, things that I've done I've been uh, um, I fixed that the, um, and it still remains to be tested but I I I I, I could have fixed the issue uh, that occurred to uh, Johannes and um, another person I don't remember the name he wrote on the discuss list about uh, running the server locally on a Windows machine that needs to be tested uh, in the next uh, in the next release. I replaced uh, um, the uh, library that we use for plotting uh, with the new release, which seems to uh, eliminate the problem of uh, excessive CPU consumption. Uh, again, it, it seems uh, to be uh, much faster, but I only tried it on my local machine, so uh, I have that card there as an its review, which is something I will do uh, as I will basically deploy it for the server. Um, there is uh, the then there is a card here uh, which is about releasing uh, uh, 0.1.4 of Geppetto that I will do in as part of these um, as part of these uh, two weeks and then there is uh, all different efforts ongoing by uh, people that um, some of which are not uh, are not at this meeting so there is uh, Adrian that is working on a 3d plotting widget and on a widget to visualize a neuroML Inside uh, inside of Geppetto, so that is gonna be uh, that's gonna be rather uh, bo both of them are gonna be rather cool. Uh, Boris is working on uh, um, uh, basically uh, being able to uh, change the um, the geometry of uh, uh, of a model as a result of a simulation on the back end, uh, and is working as a use case uh, with a pendulum. So he wants to simulate the equations using J lamps. And uh, um, having the, the an animation of the pendulum uh, being streamed to the server as a result of that, there is a, there is a new contributor. Ali was the same one who suggested the way to register uh, to record this meeting. The way Stephen is doing uh, that is uh, is going to set up his uh, environment on Windows and is going to write up uh, instructions. Uh, uh, and of course, Johannes already uh, said what is. Up to uh, Matt is uh, is also um, is helping out with the um, creating the script to set up the development environment. What Joe was talking about earlier, and uh, uh, so I've been doing a bit of um, like coordination of all these different uh, of all these different efforts in order to try and keep track of uh, what is going on. And um, I started today with um, I started today with Joe uh, working on the on the design uh, for uh, uh, new features that uh, um, we will be we will be adding for uh, for Geppetto. And uh, I also started looking at the design for the Worm Sim, which is something that um, we will uh, be that we will be delivering as part of the Kickstarter. So there's uh, lo lots of things, uh, lots of things uh, going on, but it, it's like uh, it, it, it's lots of progress at the same time. So there's other there's other cards that go into more uh, into more detailed things that I don't think um, would be interesting uh, for this uh, for this meeting. Uh, so uh, and another uh, uh, one I forgot is uh, Sergey who has found uh, the problem that was causing the uh, elastic uh, and liquid matter to explode in Geppetto. And um, so he fixed that, and now he's working uh, in order to uh, find a reason for a last bug uh, uh, where a cube with water inside uh, is basically not um, not working properly. And um, yes, and this is uh, this is pretty much a short uh, short update. 
uh, I don't know if there's any if there's any question. There's lots of stuff going on, and I'm not at my best today, so I might be forgetting things. <laughs> okay, um, pretty short update from me this time. I'm still working on the muscle cell model. Um, I've worked my way through a paper by uh, Jordan Boyle and Netta Cohen that describes a previous attempt to uh, model C. elegans muscle cell activity. Um, so I can't find a link to download the full paper, but that's the that's the abstract. Um, yeah, the model they're describing in the paper isn't perfect. So I mean, the, the main problem seems to be that it doesn't replicate the voltage spiking behavior that's been observed in actual C. elegans muscle cells. Um, but it sounds like uh, when they were writing the paper, they weren't sure whether or not the model was supposed to uh, exhibit voltage spikes uh, at all. So, so that probably explains that. Um, but if I can reproduce the results they've got from their model. Oh, thanks, Stephen. <laughs> um, yeah, if I can re reproduce uh, the activity in their model, that gives me a basic model that I can then tune and work on further. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, and, uh, well, and to help with that, this uh, poor egg's shown me some Python code from the Open Source Brain project that uh, plots graphs of ion, ch ion channel behavior. So that all looks uh, pretty helpful. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to get that working and still working my way through the neuron book to, to figure out how to do it. So yeah, that's, that's about the state of things uh, here. Hello. Uh, okay. Most recently, I've been working with Padrec to um, use a uh, neural construct uh, neuron type of model uh, to do training with that. Um, I did download the uh, C. elegans neuron neural construct package and get that got that to run. Um, I uh, kind of came up with a plan about how to do some training in that. Uh, talked to Padrack and he said, "Yo, you should you should really look at the C302 project and use some of that." So that's what I'm kind of currently doing. Um, so basically, the idea is that I'm kind of segueing into the uh, more neuralist, uh, realistic neuron types of uh, models. Um, so uh, prior to that, uh, I was able to um, with the current model that I have, which is I'm calling the perceptron. Uh, neurons uh, using a uh, Fourier transform fitness function that I mentioned quite a long time ago. Uh, I was able to train the connectome to produce a pretty nice sinusoidal, smooth sinusoidal pattern um, based on the light touch, light touch sensory neurons that Andre actually pointed out. Um, so that's good. Um, what I was not able to do is to actually produce any undulations whatsoever um, based on just the sensory inputs being the light touch sensors. And to me that kind of says, uh, it kind of agrees with uh, some of the literature I've been reading and actually the thing that Rainer just pointed out, <laughs> uh, it, it kind of maybe uh, says something in that direction that the, the muscle cells themselves are actuators. Um, uh, so in other words, there, I, couldn't, I could not find a fitness function to actually cause the connectome to itself be a cyclical pattern generator. So it seems, of course, these are perceptrons, they're not the real neurons, but it seems like um, it relies on external um, feedback from either, well, not external necessarily, but maybe muscle wall uh, feedback or, or something like that to actually perpetuate the undulations. So anyway, but it was interesting to get it to actually do a smooth, assume a smooth sinusoidal shape based on touching it 
with those uh, those sensory touch light touch neurons that Andre was talking about uh, initially. So that's pretty much what I've been actually doing. That's probably exactly the one of the most recent papers I've read. That yeah, um, like a motor neuron can sort of uh, sense the the segment of the worm, you know, just adjacent to it, and sense its curvature in some way that's not known yet. And then it, using that, it assume it, it fires a you know it's so to to cause a curvature in its segment. So it's very interesting. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.